be honest, <laughs> no. these things happen. And Chris reminded me last night too. He's like, no, make sure the clocks aren't gonna go off. All right, now make sure I'm on my phone. Quick here and see if we are going live. Does it look like we're live yet? Looks like, uh, yep, there's Benjamin, he's on. Benjamin, hey! Good evening, good evening in Germany. All right. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. And this week I have another fantastic guest. I feel so incredibly fortunate to know so many incredible people in the film history community. This week, we are going to make a recipe from Mary Pickford. And my special guest is Angie Schneider. She is on the board of Hollywood Heritage and she is a Mary Pickford collector. So welcome, Angie. Well, thank you, Carrie, for having me and happy Women's History Month too, of all people we're doing and what tomorrow's International Women's Day too. So I don't think we could have picked a better time to kind of celebrate the woman that made Hollywood pretty, you know, essentially that we could say. I agree a hundred percent. Now, is that pie whacket or is it's that- Theta. <laughs> it's Theta Barra. Oh, wow. So Theta did, uh, the negotiations yeah. went through and uh, she got yeah. the treats. If you do know, right now is locked up, she'll probably be let out a little bit because there's food at the table. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did advertise the presence of cats. So we, we but yeah, I saw that. So yeah, if you ever eat at our house, expect some cat fur. <laughs> just no <laughs> way around you get cat hair. It's just part of the, uh, the experience. <laughs> part of the charm. <laughs> now, when we talked about doing this episode, I had originally found a few different recipes for Mary in the cookbooks that I had collected, an enchilada recipe, a raspberry tart recipe and a strawberry shortcake recipe. But you blew the doors off my world when I called you and we talked and you told me that you had the original recipes from the head chef of Pick Fair yes. in his handwriting that was served at Pick Fair. And I said, well, you gotta <laughs> do that then. Well, yeah, because you've mentioned in the past, you know, I mean, the photo play magazines, the cookbooks, they're just so much fun, so much to the time, but you always just wonder, you know, was it a publicist story? Was it someone in the family? And then, you know, I, I think even if it does come from the actor or actress, it, you know, they're going to put out the most fun recipe. Are they going to really put out what their realistic life is? You know, I think Mary is the perfect example of that because, you know, she did start out with a poor family and people like to, the publicists like to build off of that. So a lot of these recipes, you do see like photo play, it's either potatoes, it's usually things that, you know, are a little bit more rationable type of a meal, when in reality, she ate French food all the time, you know, and you really kind of dive into their life. You know, it's really kind of amazing. But like you mentioned, um, where the recipes came from was a gentleman named Albert Shea, uh, C-H-A-I-X, so very French name. Um, I think, you know, we've been trying to dig more into his life a little bit, and he came to pick fair, we believe, with Douglas Fairbanks. Some of the recipes date to 1919, uh, kind of right before pick fair. Um, recipes go right up to 1932, which have been kind of the end of Fairbanks and pick fair. Um, so I, I really think he was more kind of the person that followed along with Doug. Um, but his role at pick fair was he was the head of the whole pick fair team. And he would sit down with Mary and Doug, they would come up with the menus, the recipes, and then he would hand it to the kitchen team and they would go ahead and make it. Um, so what we're in, then in the process of doing right now is um, putting it into a cookbook so that way everybody can enjoy. I mean, there's probably about 150 or so recipes. Oh, so wow. We're trying to make them <laughs> the best we can. You know, you know what the vintage recipes are like where it's just, Sometimes you have to modernize it a little bit. Sometimes it's hard to find the ingredients, but it's been quite the experience. Well, when the pandemic is over, I would love, and I just kind of inviting myself, but <laughs> I would love to come over to your house and find a bunch of other film history folks and just have a whole pick fair party at your home, if you don't mind, of course. Yeah, we call it the pick fair shack. <laughs> There's no uh, lodge, and then we have the pick fair shack, we call it. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah so like the recipe I gave you 
One thing I learned when we started going through making a lot of these recipes is you do have, I mean, it's almost like Julia Child, we're really having to learn a French cuisine. Um, we've learned that there's the five mother sauces of French cuisine, and we most commonly know mayonnaise in our normal daily lives, and that's actually one of the French mother sauces. Thank goodness he doesn't use mayonnaise in anything. <laughs> you know, once you get to the 40s and 50s, it feels like every recipe had mayonnaise. Um, granted, it was made a little bit differently back then, but um, the two that he uses quite a bit is the hollandaise sauce, um, which is probably another common one that we see now and then today, and then bechamel sauce, which is like that white cream sauce. And I had to get pretty good at making both of those. Um, and then kind of piggybacking off what you did last week with the chicken soup, we make a lot of bone broth as well and keep it in the freezer because he a lot of the recipes you know, want a fresh homemade kind of a stock or a broth as well. So, you know, hollandaise sauce, I think you're kind of going right to the belly of the beast of French cuisine. <laughs> and it's fairly easy. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to getting started. And you've actually really helped me because the other night when we did our preparations, you taught me how to make my own very simple double broiler. Yes. Because I've had many of these recipes where I've gone, I don't know what it is. I don't know where I find one. And then you were like, you told me to just take a pan, put a little water, put a glass bowl. Boom. And you got a double boiler. <laughs> oh, it is. I mean, a double boiler. Um, yeah, because the whole part, and I, I like that method because I actually have like a true double boiler, but it's so big. Recipes like this, where there's that middle edge of making an egg where you don't want to scramble it. You know, you don't want to get too hot, but then you don't want it raw either. <laughs> so, um, you know, you want as much little surface space on a pan. So like what you have is perfect, a small pan, a small bowl. That's all you need. And, you know, the French love the raw eggs. I don't know why, but <laughs> so usually if you are ever that kind of person, if anybody's out there watching this and wants to make their own hollandaise sauce, feel free if you want to buy pasteurized eggs, if you can find them, it's a little bit harder to find, or you could even just put them in a warm bath first yourself. There's ways of pasteurizing, but otherwise, as long as you kind of cook it just right, there's really nothing to worry about. So shall we cook the hollandaise and then we'll set it aside and do our- Yeah, um, yeah let's do it. Um, so his recipe um, is a little bit thicker than the normal um, hollandaise sauce. Um, typically you would use like a clarified butter. So if anybody is watching this and is on a little bit more of a health diet and you're like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of butter, that's a lot of this, you can you know, substitute with like a clarified butter. but. He uses straight up butter. He uses four egg yolks, which I see you have your four egg yolks already. Uh, perfect. And he uses a half a cup of butter and about two tablespoons of lemon juice. I find that probably the best hollandaise sauces I've had have just that right amount of lemon. Actually, if you ever go to Beachwood Canyon Cafe, like right when you enter Hollywood land, they have uh, Eggs Benedict with the most fabulous lemon hollandaise sauce too. So if you ever want to compare what you made versus a really good one, that's worth the check out. Um, and then he adds a little whipping cream just because he wants that thicker hollandaise. Um, so first you're just going to go ahead and whisk together your egg yolks with your lemon. Okay. I just Do I put them in the double boiler top? Um, what I would do is take a couple tablespoons of your lemon juice and put it with the eggs first. Okay. All right and just kind of mix that together. And then if you did get any whipping cream or a heavy cream, I'm sorry, a heavy cream, you could go ahead and put that in if you'd like. Um, if you don't have it, that's not the end of the world. Um, perfect, you got it. And then like a little salt and pepper just to taste. You got it. All right. So once you have that all mixed, now you're gonna go ahead and put it in your double boiler. Now the trick to a really good hollandaise sauce is because you're also trying to get the right thickness and it's a constant whisk. And you wanna whisk it hard enough that you start to see a lot of air bubbles. And it's getting that air into the hollandaise sauce, which is gonna help to thicken that. So you'll kind of start seeing your whisk. Mark, we need to turn my little uh, hot plate up to four the other night, right? Yeah, was... and, and you know, maybe we even have to go a little higher because um, I think you said it goes like 14. It goes to six. Yeah. Oh, six. Okay, so yeah, let's do four. <laughs> For some okay, okay. Before we do that. <laughs> and you know, if it just starts feeling like it's getting too hot, you can always turn it down. 
like I say, you just don't want to be scrambling your eggs. <laughs> and then usually, you know, I kind of do that for a good two minutes or so. I think um, Sophie, who is helping us with the animals today, I had her doing it for about three minutes or so. And it, it started to kind of get a little bit thickened. But you really want to get your arm and your wrist really kind of into that because you want to see those, those air bubbles. Um, but yeah, that's like why you're doing that. But you know, that's kind of the, um, like I said, one of the main mother um, sauces. And what I did is there's about four recipes I could think of off the top of my head that uses hollandaise. A couple of them were for the appetizers. So they did um, one night artichokes, which until I really started doing these recipes, I didn't realize I love artichoke as much as I do now. <laughs> um, Another night they did asparagus and hollandaise, which is what I grew up with. You know, we would always have our asparagus little hollandaise sauce with it. Um, there's another recipe where they did the, the standard eggs benedict. And then there's another one that's like a pastry where they kind of have like little shells that they put the hollandaise sauce in it as well. So there's, the, those are the kind of few that I can think of off the top of my head where, you know, they incorporate the hollandaise sauce. Um, for those that have never made artichoke, um, it's really kind of like you mentioned, hopefully when this pandemic's over, we can actually have a gathering. And an artichoke is kind of a fun gathering thing because what an artichoke is, it's really a flower that hasn't bloomed yet. And you kind of put that in the middle of the table and everybody just starts to pull the leaves off. And then you have the meat of the artichoke right at the bottom of that leaf. And then they just dip it in the hollandaise sauce. and. Um, clean it off the, the meat of the artichoke and kind of as a game because everybody starts picking and then you get down to the, the meat of it, which is the artichoke heart and you kind of split that amongst everybody. Um, so they're, they're great. I mean, this is an uncooked one. I steamed one already and they take about 30 minutes if you're going to steam it. Um, and then I did the asparagus as well, which only takes a couple minutes to, um, to steam. But when you have an actual artichoke like this, I usually kind of cut the top off. I trim because they had these little sharp tips off. Um, and then I put it in the steamer. So it's just a real fun kind of a gathering appetizer for everybody to, to start digging into and eating. Is it getting nice and thick for you? Well, I noticed my hot plate wasn't working and then I messed with the plug and I plugged it back in again. And now <laughs> it's working, so. Good, no, no worries. Um, but yeah, while you're still mixing, uh, another thing that Albert became very well known for at Pick Fair is he became known as the gentleman of the house that made these amazing menu cards. So I will actually meet Sophie by hand you one of these, you'll probably take it to the camera closer. He had some of the most beautiful handwriting. And when you came and sat down at dinner um, and you had your menu, he handwritten every one of these with what was gonna be on the menu. Is there any way I could get like a scan of that to post on the blog after the episode? Doesn't have the Doug and Mary. Well, this one says Doug and Mary on it. That one. This one does. This card here she's showing has the their actual their little logo on it too that says M and D for Mary and Doug. Um, but that's what when you sat down, you got these little menu cards. Um, Surprisingly, I would think there'd be a lot more of them out there. You'd think you took them home <laughs> as your souvenir, but I would have. You know, I have a hard time finding them. So if anybody out there in the collecting world comes up with more of these pick fair dinner cards, send them my way. <laughs> when, when do we add the butter? Um, as soon as you start getting a little bit of thickness, I'd probably say let's give it just a few more seconds because you had a little heating issue. Um, and then um, yeah, <laughs> the entire so yeah, let's start adding a little bit of butter. Um, with the butter, you just do a little bit at a time as you're mixing. Okay. And the butter is what's going to really kind of help thicken. So really all a hollandaise sauce is, is the right mixture between egg yolk and butter. And then, of course, the lemon. And like I said, there's some, I think the real true original French hollandaise um, instead of the whipping cream is just that right mix of water too. But um, like I said, they just like there's a little bit thicker at Pig Fair. <laughs> So I, I don't think they were great when it came to being healthy, when it came to how much meat and red meats they ate, um, how much fat, but they had very little carbs, not very much for bread, not very much for dessert. You know, it really was straight up protein, <laughs> protein and fat. <laughs> well, on the cemetery tour, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, you know, Douglas Fairbanks had a heart attack. He was 56 years old and yeah. people comment because there's quite a number of people on the cemetery tour that have died young of a heart attack that are famous and yeah. people ask me why is that and I say well 
my best guess would be maybe they didn't have, of course, cholesterol testing, heart healthy diet, like that stuff wasn't quite a thing back then. Yeah. And what was interesting when he had his funeral, one of his pallbearers was actually his fitness trainer. So I think he probably took some time off from even working out. You know, this is just my own assumption, knowing that he was so close to his personal trainer that he probably got out of shape and then was really doing a lot to try getting back into shape too. And that's not always good for you, especially if you're not eating healthy and things like that. So a lot of people smoked back then, ate yeah. red meat. It's kind of a very different. Uh... Exactly. Yeah, a lot more heart attacks. A lot earlier back then, it's sad. Um, Is it getting thick? Yeah, can it get somewhat thickened? Uh, it's it's taken a little bit of time here. I'm trying to yeah. be patient, which is not easy. You know, do you melt your butter or do you have softened butter? Uh, I'm, it kind of melted. I melted it okay. a little bit in the microwave, but then I was running around trying to mess with the lights because it's a little cloudy. Yeah, I'm really not picking up too much. Usually, again, butter. All I do when I make the hollandaise is I pull the butter and I pull the eggs out to room temperature. So I pull them out for like 30 minutes just on the counter. As long as the cats aren't around. <laughs> and then, um, you know, basically it's just soft enough that it adds a thickness. So it may not be perfectly thick for you just for the the sake of what we're doing today but you know you at least got the right combination make sure you're still gonna get the flavor um it's starting really to heat up a lot because I, I see a lot of a lot of so, steam rising yeah, out of the you can, you can actually just turn it off because you still have the heat of the pan um so turn your um your heater off or your um heat pan off and then add the rest of your butter and you should be good okay and that's all that hollandaise sauce is. So I picked us an easy one. <laughs> and it's a staple to learn about French cuisine. And then here's kind of mine. So mine's already get pretty thick. Let me grab a artichoke, but maybe I'll have Sophie pull that up to the camera a little bit closer and you can see kind of what the thickness is with the, um, the artichoke. Very nice. And um, all these dishes I have on the table right now are all from Pick Fair. Uh, so they, they obviously, as you can imagine, probably had just tons of China from everything from Louis French type of uh, China. Um, this print here um, is maybe Sophie, I'll have you bring this one up. This is her brunch dish. So it's beautiful. It's got, you know, the butterflies, the flowers. Um, then this one, you remember on your graphic design for this event where you had Mary and Buddy Rogers and uh, for My Best Girl. Huh? If you look at that, there's those two stem glasses. This actually came from that same set. So you can see the color, because obviously in black and white, you don't get the idea of what the color dishes are. <laughs> oh, and wow. it's funny, when I watch a lot of her movies, I see some of her same stuff from Pick Fair that she just uses as props and then she probably just brings them back home. So it's kind of funny. Um, but you know, she had different types of tea sets. Um, I mean, they, a lot of flower, flower plates. I mean, there's just tons. I mean, I'm always coming up with more different types of plates as well. And usually everything I get would have came from either, she had several big auctions after she passed away. So like 1981 was the biggest. Um, Dorothy Reynolds got a lot of the China. So actually a lot of the China we've gotten now has come from the Debbie Reynolds estate. And you always know because it has a sticker on it. There's usually a sticker on the set somewhere that show what lot number it was. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've got lots of different types of dishes and dish sets. So everything you see here, minus my Ovaltine glass, <laughs> is from Pig Fair. Should we explain the significance of Ovaltine sure. for people who don't know? Yeah, so um, it's kind of a fun story that what it was always said is when you did a dinner at Pig Fair, and usually we'd have the dinner, either formal dining room, sometimes it would be outside in the yard. Uh, then they'd a lot of times they actually had a screening room. So sometimes they would bring your guests in and watch a movie. But as soon as the oval team came out, you knew drink it and leave. That was their polite way of saying the party's over. You know, they never had any other nicer way to say, you know, we're done. Uh, it was just the running joke of everybody that attended the Pig Fair event was as soon as the Oval Team came out, the party was over. There have been some stories where 
just certain people have gotten a glass of Ovaltine, which basically means you're no longer invited. Party might go on, but we want you to leave. Maybe they just were a little too rowdy for their <laughs> taste. So um, yeah, so Ovaltine's kind of always been that running joke of a pick bear dinner, which is when the Ovaltine comes out, it's over. <laughs> that is awesome. And something I think you should incorporate at your upcoming uh, post-pandemic parties is have your Ovaltine ready. So that way you don't have to be the mean host to save Everybody go home. <laughs> I think we should all incorporate that idea. That's that's why it's the uncomfortable thing when you have a party is, you know, you start to get tired as a host of how you get rid of people. <laughs> so one thing I've always been curious about, Angie, is how many people did it take to run the household at Big Fair in terms of, I'm just assuming they had chauffeurs and people doing the laundry, yeah. people cleaning, people serving food in the kitchen. Like how many people did it and take? They had, to run? Whole kennel. they had stables and kennels. So they had everybody to handle the animals too. You know, usually probably in a given time and then they paid well too. It was amazing sometimes when you start, you know, we've gone to the Mar uh, Margaret Herrick library and just pulling out, you know, a lot of the stuff over there is like later on, but you know, they, they paid their, their team very well. Um, over there, but you could probably have easily four chefs in the kitchen at a time with some of the photos I have. Uh, of course, you know, everybody, everybody that served the food, very strict, you had to have white gloves. Um, even later on in Mary Pickford's life, you know, there'd be parties that maybe she wasn't hosting. She would literally watch from her bedroom window and make sure everybody that was working on the party had their white gloves. You know, she for her whole life had her her strict measures in place. <laughs> but yeah, it was quite the, the team that they had there. But I would say probably starting in the 40s, going into the 50s, everything was catered at that point. You know, I think what we see in our minds of the glamour pick fair parties really probably ended at about 1933 or so. Um, and then you still had, the, uh, you know, a few chefs that stayed, like even later on when they would have like a Thanksgiving, they would have their menus that they gave to chefs, you know, just for the family. But if there was ever a party or something at that point, it was all catered. Um, cool. but, yeah. So how did you first discover the work of Mary Pickford? Well, you know, I think I discovered her several different ways. You know, I grew up, I had a grandpa that loved silent movies, you know, so whenever I went and stayed and visited him, you know, he always put on either Harold Lloyd was his favorite, but he would always kind of throw in that word Mary Pickford, you know, and I never really kind of comprehended who that would have been. Um, both my husband and I are in the veterinary profession, so anytime we'd see a photo of somebody with animals, obviously, would just you know, your heart would melt. And I think probably the very first time I saw a picture of Mary Pickford holding the bunny rabbits, um, what I would say is like, oh, who is this beautiful curly? <laughs> she had her golden curls holding animals and then there's some with her puppies. Then you start to dig in and then also we start researching, you're like, my goodness, I mean, we wouldn't have Hollywood as we know it today if it wasn't for this woman. And then it just kind of became, then I feel like she found me a little bit too, because I mean, we just keep finding so much great stuff that really kind of builds our story and builds her story as well that, you know, we kind of found of her. I kind of have a theory in life that people and things find you sometimes yeah. instead of, of you finding them. Exactly, exactly. So I, I do think there's a little bit of that too as well. But uh, so yeah, I think we just kind of, and there's so much to Mary Pickford's life too that I don't think one person can really even know it all. I mean, when you really start digging, you almost kind of have to separate her life and chapters and decades, you know, because there's just so much to Mary Pickford that, you know, there's a gentleman out east and he's just focusing on doing a book on just all the filming locations of biograph films that were done like in Fort Lee and, and around New York. And that's just a whole, <laughs> you know, focus in itself was her biograph years. You can go back even earlier in her theater years because Mary Pickford was born um, Gladys Smith up in Toronto. And they were only in Toronto for a few years because her father unfortunately had passed away. And the only way the family could make a living was the kids went to theater. Uh, so then they end up traveling to New York, uh, and that's where she started working for David Blasco and uh, just focusing on the theater life, you know, so that's a whole chapter in itself until she just couldn't find enough parts to support the family. And she had two siblings, Jack and Lottie, same thing. They both tried at theater too, but it just got to the point where parts were becoming so limited that 
she did the one thing she never wanted to do was her mom says, you know, you're going to have to go into the flickers, you know, as they called it back then, the flickers and the moving pictures. And, you know, Mary once said, I'd rather be a prostitute than have to be pushed into going into the movies. But Mary knew the only way that she was going to be able to support her family was if she made that visit to Biograph and to D.W. Griffith, which then starts her whole new chapter of, you know, getting into the movies. And, you know, that kind of goes there in history. <laughs> and she then brought, she kind of dabbled around after that. And she brought so much subtlety to film acting. I really think she deserves so much credit for shaping the way film acting transformed. She really did, you know, and she fought a lot with D.W. Griffith. You know, she wanted to really take that directing realm as well with him. You know, he felt that if people were gonna be, pay money for a ticket to see a movie, you see the whole actor you're paying for the whole person. She wanted sometimes, no, show my expressions on my face. He's like, no, people aren't paying just to see a face. They're paying to see your whole body, you know? So she really kind of fought. She knew what would look good on camera. She knew what people would want to see. She had that natural instinct. And, and that, I mean, she was a powerhouse. You didn't fight with Mary Pickford, whether it came to money, whether it was to control. <laughs> and her mom, Charlotte, was really the, the big driving force behind that as well too. Her mom was extremely strong. And, you know, both Mary and her mom knew her self-worth that she made sure people, oh, we had a kitty. <laughs> Hi, wax, it's starting to want to come and show up in the picture. <laughs> what would you say is your first, when did you first learn about Mary Pickford? Or well, this, this, this topic always comes up on a lot of these episodes for me. Um, I saw the image before I saw the person because yeah. as a little girl, I fell in love with old Hollywood through the universal monster films of the thirties. That was kind of my gateway drug. But then I would get books and I would get magazines and you know, whatever I could get at the time. This is of course way before the internet. And I saw her image and those images to me are so powerful. And in many cases, a photograph in a book or magazine was my introduction to a lot of these stars. And I remember seeing her in a photograph with these beautiful long golden curls, this kind of light behind her head, holding these flowers. Mm -hmm. And those images are so powerful. I remember just sitting in my room staring at some of these images and just my imagination and my mind <laughs> would just kind of run wild looking at them. And then at that time when I was growing up, unless you had, you know, VHS, which even when VHS came out, there was such limited selections, you know, it was like, Casablanca, Citizen Kane, kind of like the staples, you know, certain things would come out. But then I think it was in college when I started really watching a lot more silent film. And she was just so incredibly inspiring to me, both personally and professionally of her business acumen. Because I think so many creative people, they have creativity, but when it comes to anything business or finance or that kind of stuff, they just yeah have no idea what to do. And I can relate to that. But yeah. Mary had both sides of the that kind of intelligence. And just to have that sort of intelligence and foresight, like she could see trends coming before a lot of other people could. She just was so prescient in so many ways. Yeah, she did. And, and you know, we'll kind of go into a little bit later to her later life. But yeah, she, you're, you're exactly right. She was a forerunner on so much, you know, whether it was getting into radio later on, whether, you know, we hear so many different celebrities had their own cosmetic lines, like she was one of the first to do that. Um, you know, even her one of her last movies, Kiki, as much as people are like, oh, that's probably her worst movie she ever made. It was almost a precursor to pre-code. You know, she kind of, kind of, you know, she even had Busby Berkeley uncredited on Kiki, you know, and that was kind of, she foresaw the pre-code type style movies coming up. And, and the, so she really did have a, a keen sense of, you're right, the business. Um, and she probably was the most photogenic woman of the 20th century. I mean, every photographer you could think of, you know, whether it was the early studios like Moody, um, all the way to the more modern photographers like Corel. I mean, everybody took her photo. And I always tell people, if you really want to get into collecting, I mean, Mary Pickford's a, a great start because there's so many photos. I mean, I, at some point, you have to draw the line of, you know, we had to now focus and pick our main areas because you can go from zero to a thousand photos and really no time with Mary Pickford where Theta Barra is our other big kind of focus. And I'd probably say for like every 50 Pickford photos, we get we get one good Theta Barra, you know, so it's really, a, she 
had so many photos done of her and, and they're all beautiful. And yeah, you, know, you can really see her pattern of ages because you yeah, have her earlier studio shots. Then she brought Charles Rocher into like starting with Love Light, um, who was her cameraman and he knew the lighting on her. And that's where you really did the change in her movies, see a big change in her images because he knew how to get that lighting, get the curls, everything about her just to be perfect. So that was a, a great partnership for her later on. What are some of your favorite Pickford movies? Because she did have such a long career. She did. I mean, and again, you, that's one of those areas where you kind of almost have to put it into chapters. You know, she had her biograph years. Uh, majority of her biographs exist, which is nice, you know, and the, most of them are in public domain. So you can sometimes just cruise around YouTube and just, and they're, and they're shorts. And that's always a great thing I like. Um, about introducing people to silent movies, introducing to Mary Pickford, because if people don't quite have the, the attention span yet to watch a full featured silent movie, there's lots of great shorts. Um, I think probably one of my earlier favorites would be like uh, Fans from the Cricket. And we're very fortunate to have that movie today. Um, there was a point in Mary's life where she would have been happy just to burn all her movies. She thought, the newer generation would never care to see any of them, but it was very short lived because even Lillian Gish, her best friends, like, don't think that, <laughs> you know, donate it. Um, and then towards the end of Mary's life, any of the lost movies that were missing was probably one of her biggest regrets. Her goal before she died was to see Fans from the Cricket again because it's the only movie that had her, Jack, and Lottie in it. And, you know, I, I think that was heartbreaking and that's what was so important to starting the Mary Pickford Foundation for her um, as part of her legacy was to make sure these movies were found, preserved, and thank goodness now we have Fans from the Cricket, which is a great movie to kind of sit and watch. And um, so that's a great one early on. Um, my husband's favorite is probably Little Annie Rooney. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think there's a time you can watch that and not cry. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. And, and yeah, it's a, I think for anybody, it's really the iconic Mary Pickford movie. You know, early on, she kind of always played that waif, that poor person. Uh, then later on, she got to the, you know, I'm a 33 year old playing a child, but she can do it. And, you know, I, I think those child roles were important to her because that was how she was able to live a child life that she didn't have. And when she did Little Annie Rooney, she wanted to have so much involvement in writing the script and the screenplay to it because she wanted to really incorporate what she didn't have growing up. So I, I think that movie was important to her from kind of that perspective. And then her more mature roles, you know, like I, I love Love Light, I mean, not as much as a story, but again, that's where she starts introducing like Rocher into it as a cameraman. And he just knew how to get the lighting on her. She just looks beautiful in that. And then My Best Girl is a fun one, too. I mean, you just can't go wrong with the Mary Pickford movie. <laughs> I go to the San Francisco Silent Film Festival every year, and I've been going, gosh, since like 2001. And several years ago, it was such a treat. They had Kevin Brownlow, who is mm -hmm. my hero. He was there, and he introduced a 35-millimeter print of Sparrows. Oh. And this print was so beautiful. I don't even know that I breathed the whole movie. I was just like... <laughs> just sitting there absolutely stunned because it's, yeah, it's a Mary Pickford film, but it's so gothic at the I same know. time. It's a gothic swamp. And to my right is the um, insert for Sparrows. Um, you know, and that's again, once she started United Artists, you know, so many of her pictures, I think her strongest pictures when, when she really did get control of what she wanted. You know, she again went through phases. She started with Biograph. She left Biograph for a little bit because, again, she wanted her self-worth. Where can I get more money? <laughs> and at that time, she was with her first husband, Owen Moore, and they went over to Independent Motion Pictures, as we know of it as Imp uh, Pictures, our studio with uh, Carl Lemley. But unfortunately, at the time she signed on, they decided, well, we're going to move the studio to Havana, Cuba. And so her and Owen Moore had to go down to Cuba and it was just the worst experience for her. The weather, you got to think those curls, she can never keep up on the curls down there. They always kept being food poisoning because the chefs didn't know how to cook down there. And it was probably the worst year of her life. And unfortunately, a lot of those movies are lost, but she never liked any of them anyways. You know, she kind of always went into that. But then, yeah, she ended up being her United Artists and, and movies like Sparrows were, I think, really where she started perfecting her art with that because she had the control with it. But yeah, Kevin Brownwell does a very good job, even uh, when the Prey Goes By book, 
you know, just what she experienced in Sparrows, you know, that was kind of her end of a relationship with William Bodine, who kind of helped directed it was, it just wasn't safe. He did not care about safety at all. You know, you have a hundred pound Mary carrying a bunch of orphans on her back over a bunch of alligators, <laughs> even though he claimed that the alligators had their mouth shut, um, tied shut, but you know, you're any swift move that you're wrong, she would have lost one of the, the children and, and that scared her. And she really felt that it was a great movie, but the safety was pretty much put out of the window after that for um, doing Sparrows. But I also I love My Best Girl as well. I, that's probably, honestly, that's probably my favorite picture because I mean, it's, it's fun when she plays the little girls and all, but I love that role of her as like this young woman and she's yeah. kind of got this wacky family and then she meets Buddy Rogers and I think right. the the boss is fun. and he's just adorable in that movie. Yeah, I mean, that was, you know, he really kind of fell in love with her at that point, you know, and he, she had like between three men to go ahead and, and pick into that role and, you know, she definitely confided in Buddy at that point. That's when they first met was, um, you know, my best girl. He just finished up with Wings, as we know, he won the very first Oscar. Uh, for Wings and he remembers just kind of coming off the set from Wings and heading right over to Mary's bungalow where he got to meet her and he remembers Mary asking well who's your favorite actress you know like right there you think you want to get the answer right because let's <laughs> see when you get the part and he said Norma Shearer <laughs> and he right away he remembers walking out of the bungalow and be like well I blew that interview or you know I'm not going to get the my best girl role with her because I said Norma Shearer <laughs> But yeah, she she really did it, you know, enjoy having them. And, um, you know, and that's how I kind of got to know the family too. So right around the time my best girl was being filmed is when Charlotte was diagnosed with cancer. Her mom um, was starting to die. And I, I know Buddy had gone over there quite a bit and met her mom at that time. So even though her mother had passed away, you know, before um, they ever got married, you know, later on, you know, he still got to know her mom. And, and, and that's kind of a sweet part of that too. But uh, yeah, My Best Girl is a, a great one where she, you know, Coke has okay, you know, being that's the one she won her Oscar for, but she really did come strong with My Best Girl. And the poster behind me here is the original three sheet poster for My Best Girl. So it's just that perfect image of Mary and Buddy. Uh, several years ago at the UCLA archive, I got to see Taming of the Shrew, and I'd always heard that it was just this huge disaster and that it was awful, but then I thought, you know, I want to see this for myself and make up my own mind. And it wasn't nearly as terrible as I had often been led to believe, And but I found myself really liking the most about the movie is the sequences where Doug and Mary are silent and they're not talking, <laughs> saying actual dialogue, but they're reacting to each other. <laughs> because there's definitely a lot of silent film type stuff going on in that movie even though you know it's um it's a sound film right and they're just so good together and it made me wish like oh I wish more. They could have... well and they're kind of I guess technically there could be one more because in Black Pirate where you know he couldn't get this really done that's actually Mary in that scene um so you can actually if you ever go on youtube and stuff you could see the the makeup test actually in color you know where she's playing that role so there's that one few minute or seconds there where uh you could see they were in a movie together but um but yeah you know taming the shrew it was really kind of their end of the relationship you know at that point you know it was hard for Douglas Fairbanks, and I'm sure people like Tracy Gassel and everybody can kind of dive into that further, but, you know, he was a swashbuckler. He wanted to run around, and we didn't have the sound technology to follow somebody, so you're confining a man who has so much energy, you know, into a role, and then not to mention their marriage is on the rocks, so you're lucky if he showed up on time or <laughs> he even knew his lines. And so they had to, even though it's a Shakespearean film, they had to add lines in because you know, he just wasn't prepared at that point. So there was a lot of friction, you know, on that. And then that's kind of the same thing when Mary did her last movie, Secrets, you know, as much as, you know, one reason she liked the doing the secrets is because the costumes, she knew the costumes would be great. She loved her costumes, but that was really her one last shot to save Doug. She knew, she felt she had these hints that he's having infidelity. And so she wanted to do a movie that had the storyline of infidelity, but the woman staying by his side. Like, I think she was hoping to say, listen, I could stand by your side if this happened. We're going to work through this until she finally got the true proof that he was having an affair on her with um, 
but you know, so that's kind of just even an interesting. So sometimes even the movie's not that great. There's a reason she did it. You know, that really, again, is what makes Ray Pickford who she is. And it's, it's sad because it seemed that her life completely imploded within just a few years because the loss of basically her screen career, her marriage to Fairbanks, her mother died, her brother died, her sister died. I mean, that is catastrophic loss within like less than what, five something year time frame. Yeah, her mom died in 28, you know, and then she, you know, a year later did, um, you know, that's when she went ahead and did coquette. She cut her curls, you know, that was her, felt her liberating perspective. But then once her mom died, you know, that she wasn't going to be able to, I think, bring in her brother and sister and the, the life that they were having. And, you know, yeah, sadly, they both done, died fairly young, you know, the partying and, you know, enjoying life kind of caught up to them. And then, you know, she, by the time 32, 33 came along, you know, Doug was slowly coming out of her life. And then he even died in 1939. So, yeah. you know, even though they were divorced at that point, you know, it's still in that 1930s decade where so much happened to her. Um, she went into Christian sciences in that time as well. I think she was just looking for anything to help her through the grieving. After her mom died, she wrote two books. Um, let's see, I think I got them here. The two books she wrote for the Christian sciences was, um, why not try God? You know, so again, even though it's probably not the most obviously cheery, entertaining book to read, it's again, it's knowing her life and when she was at at that point when she wrote that, and then my rendezvous with life. Uh, so both of these, I think she was really trying to find some spiritual help, you know, through that process. And then, yeah, 1933 comes around, her brother Jack passes away, and then, you know, Lottie shortly after that. And Lottie had one daughter, Gwen. And when Charlotte was still alive, Charlotte and Mary had somewhat adopted Gwen. So Gwen was there through Mary through most of the 30s, which is nice, you know, that Mary raised Gwen and that was her one, you know, close attachment she still had with the family. And then of course, Buddy Rogers came into the picture and, you know, they got married and then came the 40s and they actually adopted two children <laughs> to again, try building that, that family. And after she left the screen, she tried a lot of other things. So let's talk about the radio and the parties at Pick Fair radio show she used to do. She did um, a few different times she did radio. So she did uh, radio starting in about 34, 35 uh, with NBC. And what she was trying, what she felt was missing in radio was scripts. Same thing early on in movies when she teamed up with Francis and Mary, Francis Marion, she felt what movies were missing was scripts even though there was no sound, we needed to have some type of dialogue. And that was something she was, was very important to her early on in the movies. And then she kind of felt the same thing in radio. There's just no script, no dialogue. So she started um, a real short lived radio show just called Mary Pick for Dramas. It wasn't anything, you know, you can go on newspapers, you can go into Lantern, you can go into, you know, past archives. You could see um, some of the storylines that she did. Um, and then eventually that show ended because she felt she couldn't find enough um, plays that can be converted easily into radio. A year later then she did what was called Parties at Pick Fair. And that was a radio show. At first she was gonna go back to NBC, but then they ended up picking it up on CBS. And that's where she wanted to bring back the theory of these grand parties at Pick Fair. And she wanted to have guests. So what she would do is bring in Ginger Rogers, you know, any of the, you know, the up and coming actors and actresses at that time. Errol Flynn came on a few times. I mean, she had some great guests. I did a blog. So if anybody goes to my, if you're really interested in all the guests, I did list out each night that she had and who was on her show that night. And they either had themes, like they'd have like a pirate night theme. And then what they would do is again, have like a script, you know, something that they acted out over radio. Um, but that was also depression era. So that only lasted like 18 weeks of episodes just because she just wasn't, you know, everybody had far more worried things to do than listen to a woman in her big, <laughs> you know, home in Beverly Hills and the party she's having. So um, unfortunately that one, was short lived. And then 1938, she was looking, she still didn't want to give up radio. So she's like, how well, is another way I can get into radio? And that's when she wanted to get into cosmetics. 
So she actually, um, Sophie, you see those three block blue boxes there? Yeah. Um, so she got into creating her, a ring booklet too, her own cosmetic line. And what she was hoping with that is that she can create her products and then talk basically the radio show of you about beauty. You know, that's how I think she was hoping to incorporate her aging is what do I do? Like she had these great booklets that would come with the cosmetics. Um, and actually on my blog, I did type out this entire booklet. <laughs> so if you want to read, you know, it's what Mary did every day. You know, she, I always think of the Joan Crawford movie where she's got the bowl of ice. <laughs> you know, apparently Mary says she did that too. You know, she would soak her face in ice, but you know, she felt like if she were to create her own beauty line that she uses, you know, for a cost that anybody could afford. And then unfortunately a radio show didn't come of it. And the cosmetics, you know, probably only lasted maybe six months to a year of that. It got discounting clear and said the drugstores really fast and only so much of it even exists. But, um, you know, it's, it's still, like you said, though, it's kind of her trying. Some will say that was she not successful later on because she didn't have Charlotte, you know, because Charlotte was the driving success, possibly. But, you know, it's it was a hard time in the 30s for anybody to try reinventing themselves. And that decade was just so brutal for so many Americans that I think you're right. It just, right. all the stuff that kind of Hollywood represented was changing so much right. for people. Yeah. And, and, you know, even in the thirties, she kept saying she's going to have a comeback. You know, she had her own production company. She even partnered back up with Lasky for a short time where they had the pick for Lasky studios, you know, so she didn't really want to walk away from the movies per se, but you know, at that time she was married to, you know, Buddy Rogers and he had his band and he was the orchestra leader and she really didn't want to kind of follow with him, you know, as well, you know, with, with what he was doing. And then, like I said, come, you know, early forties, then let's try to have a family. <laughs> I think too, I mean, I think Hollywood's ages now, but I'm assuming back then it was probably 10 times worse than it is today. And since her image even more so than a lot of actresses was predicated on extreme youth and being the child, then when that child grows up, it's almost like a child star, although she wasn't quite, but you know what I mean? It, that's when yeah. the, the child star grows up. I think that's up. possible even later, because I, I think, oh, um, in the 30s and 40s, there's data. <laughs> I say it, Mara. <laughs> yeah, now walk by. <laughs> um, you know, what happened later though, I, you know, even in the forties and fifties, she did a lot of fundraisers. I mean, that's what she wanted to, <laughs> she wanted to dedicate her life um, to just being able to, you know, anytime like a, a new, I think I have a, I'll dig out, I have a little um, shovel for when she did the digging ground for one of the Jewish hospitals here in LA. She helped start the motion pictures fund home um, which actually is right down the road from my house. So that's another thing. Every time I drive by, I think of Mary, oh, Sophie found it. So there's this little shovel here that she got for the reading oh, wow. ceremony. And I mean, at those ages, she was a little bit older, but I, I don't think it affected her as much until even later when, again, she became very spiritual and she believed a lot in what our beliefs were. And she started to think, well, if people believe me as that golden curls. I don't want to disappoint people. And that's where she eventually just said, you know, I don't want them to see what I look like now. I want them to remember me for how I was, you know, back then. And, and that's when she kind of, you know, slowly stopped with her public. Well, also, um, this topic also comes up a lot on my little Hollywood Kitchen discussions is how a lot of these stars would be so typecast too, mm -hmm. not just the ages and things, but the typecasting. And then I think she said a quote, correct me if I get it wrong, but something about the little tramp made Chaplin, but then it turned around and killed him. I wasn't going to wait for the little girl <laughs> exactly. to kill me. You know, yeah, later he went into dictator, you know, he, but then eventually I just couldn't get rid of that tramp image. And yeah, same thing for her. She um, really had no problem getting rid of the, the wave, even though she brought the wave back. I mean, she just had the curls and the, the wild hair to play the, the crazy poor girl that <laughs> lived in a transient life. But, you know, then, yeah, when she did um, Poor Little Rich Girl, which is one of her earliest, you know, you know, here I'm in my twenties playing that child role. Like I said, I think for the, the up to little Annie Rooney, she did enjoy it, you know, because that was her 
living a life that she couldn't have as a child. But yeah, I mean, she was what, 33 years old and a little Annie Rooney when she was playing a child. And granted, she can fit and play that role. It was to the point where she wanted, you know, she brought Ernst Lubitsch over from Germany because she really, um, you know, Rosita came even before little Annie Rooney, but she did Rosita and her fans, they wanted, you know, it was part of her fans that also kind of typecasted her more than Mary or the studios did because I mean, she had United Artists at that point. She could have done whatever she wanted, but she knew what the fans wanted. Just like, um, it's interesting, we collect so many photos on Pick There and we get a lot of candid photos, just what fans have taken. And Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford, they all believe that it's the fans that built these houses. So you would actually have photos of fans just walking in the pool, taking photos of themselves. I mean, the gate was open, people wanted to come in and take photos of themselves. You know, they felt we wouldn't have this if it wasn't for them. You know, so, I mean, she did anything her fans wanted. So I, I think part of the typecasting came from the people that were paying to see her. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that she really did lead a productive life long after her, her career as an actress was over though, between producing and charity work and personal life. Like she really did have a lot going on. Oh yeah. And like I said, she had Gwen, which by that time her, her niece had grown up and was, you know, starting her own family. And then she had Roxanne, right, the two adopted children that she had. I mean, and, and even then Buddy and her traveled a lot. You know, they, they traveled all over and, you know, so she, she traveled. But what's interesting with where the change of picture happened is, you know, you hear a lot of stories, well, she was a recluse. You know, I, I don't think she was as much as a recluse as what we want to image as just this woman that never came out of her, her room. What people don't realize is when they attended the party and they're like, well, we never saw Mary. She just stayed up in her bedroom. Is Pickford at that point was really rented out to almost like a conference center, you know? So if somebody wanted to have some type of organization, fundraiser, you'd almost lease the grounds of pick there, be catered. She may not even necessarily have been part of that event, you know? So, I mean, she could have been traveling or, <laughs> you know, seeing the world as any woman should do it when they're at that age. Um, but yeah, she, she always kept a very busy life, you know, but there's no doubt about it. And I mean, you gotta think we, we take it for granted when we watch the Academy Awards or the Oscars. You know, this is something that a woman helped come up with the idea in her living room. <laughs> and she still stayed part of the Academy of Motion Pictures. You know, she stayed on a lot of committees and boards and, you know, kind of helped make decisions. Well, I know one of the questions that once we check in with what people are asking us, I know we're going to get asked about Pick Fair, Piazadora, and what the heck happened. So do you want to address the, the elephant in the room? <laughs> You know, and, and being on the board of Hollywood Heritage, you know, one of our biggest responsibilities is preservation. Um, you know, I, I think it was our lesson in preservation for sure. You know, I, I think at that point we just took things for granted. But I think it's also knowing the history. I, I, I think we jump on Pia Zadora too much because of who she is. <laughs> you know, she was a B rated actress. Um, you know, so I, I put you know, she's kind of the cause, but not me necessarily the reason. Um, but you have to start with the very history of Pick Fair, which I'll start with and we'll kind of lead up. People may not even know who Piazador is. Um, so Pick Fair was originally just a hunting lodge, you know, in the turn of the century before Beverly Hills was even built up. It was just way out there and, you know, nothing around except rattlesnakes and coyotes. And uh, Doug bought the house and when he married Mary Pickford that was going to be the home that they lived in. Uh, the name Pick Bear just came from publicists. You know people were typing up things, articles in newspapers. It's not a name that was created by Doug and Mary themselves. It was just kind of that name that was kind of thrown at them. Um, so what they did is they hired um, you know a, a famous architect Wall Smith that come, came in and his he, what he wanted to do first was just tear down the lodge. He said you know if I build on this lodge, it's gonna at some point come crashing down. There's just no substance to this lodge. But Doug and Mary are like, we don't care. We want to build onto this lodge. So even then he was kind of like, oh, you know, Mr. Nuff's like, I don't know if we should do this. So I mean, they're lucky pick theirs to this law as it did, according to him. Um, but then uh, so again, they they built it into what we know today as pick there. Um I I think probably what would have been best for both Mary and Pick Fair is after she and Doug divorced, uh, 
she actually put Pickfair on the market. Uh, let's see, that little book right there in the plastic sleeve, right to your left there. So in the late 30s, you could just wait the whole thing over. She put Pickfair on the market. And this is a lovely, very rare, but it's just amazing. It's the actual um, book that the realtor gave out to anybody who was ever interested in Pickfair. Oh, wow. Um, it's got all the photos, the history of Pickfair. Um, at that time, she introduced the concept to Beverly Hills is because she had so much art in it too. Um, here, I'll just give that to you. That it doesn't become a museum. You know, so she did throw that idea even at that time to Beverly Hills. They declined it. Um, but then she decided she had a change in heart and she didn't want to sell it. Buddy Rogers really did. Buddy, I mean, here's a man marrying a woman who wants to stay at her ex-husband's home. You know, it and plus at that time, as we know, a lot of like Carol Lombard and Clark Gable, everybody was moving to the valley. They wanted their ranches, they wanted their space. Same thing, Buddy and Mary loved their horses. They wanted to move to the valley. And, but she had that change in heart and she decided to stay at Pick Fair. And I think that haunted her, you know, literally speaking of just her memories, everything that she had that she no longer has. And with that, she remodeled it a lot. And you can even like the Margaret Herrick Library, you can see all the different plans of every time that houses are modeled. Or even when you get photos, you're like trying to date them based on, oh, these windows are different over here. Uh, so that really changed a lot. Who knows if she would have sold it, then maybe someone would have torn it down in the forties or you know maybe somebody would have landmarked it and actually kept up on it and left it as it was. So I think over the years as she got older, you know, it just didn't have the upkeep anymore that it needed. Um, before, like her last years of her life, before she drew up her will, um, again, Buddy and Mary reached out to UCLA, they reached out to USC, Beverly Hills again, and says, does anybody want Pick Fair as a museum, you know, anything that, and everybody declined because about the upkeep at that time would have been $400,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And nobody could yeah. afford that upkeep at that point. Uh, but then after that is when she really, again, her films, the preservation of it is what mattered to her. And in her will, she wanted Pickfair sold for whatever the most money she can get for it to support the Mary Pickford Foundation, to be able to find her films, to be able to preserve them. Even at that time, she knew, I don't care what happens to the house. I don't care if it gets demolished. I just want my foundation to preserve my legacy. And in fact, in her will, Buddy Rogers only got a million dollars and with that will, he got what was called Pick Fair uh, Lodge, which was, if you ever go now with what Pick Fair is today, you get on Pick Fair Way, there's a house right next to Pick Fair, and that's where Buddy had lived. So then Pick Fair went on the, the market, and the Bus family, as we know, the Lakers, um, Dr. Bus bought it, and they did some cosmetic renovating to it remodeling more or less on um, the 84 Olympics were coming up. So they really wanted to use the home uh, to be able to entertain. And even then they knew, I mean, the carpeting, I mean, it just wasn't kept up, you know, when they had gotten it. Uh, and then sadly, yeah, it went back on the market and that's when Pia Zadora bought it. And even before Pia Zadora, and she lived there for a little while. Um, I have actually some photos of her and her kids at Pick Fair, and I tried reaching out to her even, you know, like just under the circumstance, I'm not here to berate you <laughs> about what happened. I just, I want photos. I want what history you have of what we can think of Pick Fair as, and I never, ever got a response. But um, the, the story is, is that her contractors worked with Beverly Hills, and when they started trying to renovate the house, yeah, there's the termite damage, there was the dry rot. They brought in both the Beverly Hills um, Commission, they brought in Beverly Hills Historical Society, they brought in all the people to help with that. Um, but everybody's decision was it's got to come down. And even the architect, um, well, Sness Jr., his son, even was like, I'm surprised it lasted this long, the way my dad talked about it, you know, it probably should come down. Um, but regardless, it's sad to say the least, you know, because it's the history, it's what we remembered. Beverly Hills reason for not wanting to do anything with landmarking status was because it changed too much. And even nowadays when we're doing any type of preservation it is always one of the dilemmas is if something changed too much from what the historical, you know, perspective of it is, it's changed, it's, it's hard to landmark it. Um, but, you know, it, it is, 
It is sad. And I, I think where Pia Zadora made the mistake is she went on that reality show and what said it was haunted. You know, she came up with all these rumors of why she tore it down. And that didn't set people off right either. You know, she should have just stayed out of it, let her contractors in Beverly Hills be the ones to announce why it had to come down. Um, part of Pig Fair is still there. Um, the guest house that was built in the 30s. So again, if you were to come and look at Pig Fair, uh, kind of like the North End, driving down Pig Fair Way, you can see the guest house still. Um, and they had to keep two, two walls of the living room. Again, so it, it doesn't make us feel any better, but there's some parts <laughs> of it still there. Um, but I, what makes me feel better about it is knowing what Mary's wishes were at the end that Pig Fair was to support her. So all of us as preservationists and film lovers were kind of torn. We know where the money went. Um, but I think there was enough opportunities for it to have been landmarked before Piazzadora got it. You know, I think Beverly Hills should have been on it a little bit sooner. Um, I think the Mary Pickford Foundation, maybe before they did sell it as part of her will, maybe they should have. You know, there's so many people we could point blame on, you yeah. know, and there's just not much we can do. So I think Piazzadora is just half of it. You know, I don't think it's fair to always just attack her right away as a person who tore it down. Um, you know, why did it get to that point to allow her to do that? And, and then you could put the blame on Mary too. Why didn't we do better renovating and keeping up on the house? You know, so it's, it is one of those tough things. And that's why we've tried finding as much artifacts as we can, you know, to still, like you said, have a little pig fair party, <laughs> even though it's nothing fancy. You know, we had the dishes, you know, I try like um, a lot of these things that I have out are like the, she can show those up to the camera. I like the little cards that would have been given at the dinner table. Um, she's gonna put- Let's like, look at some more of this memorabilia. Yeah, so like these were the invite cards. And they're like, she always had artists paint things of pick bear, um, oh. match books. I mean, she just did <laughs> a little higher. There you go. <laughs> I mean, you know, it is fun to try finding so much of pick bear. Um, here's an example of her book plate. A lot of, you know, she loved her, her book plate. So on that book plate is both Doug, Mary, and then their favorite dog at the time, Zorro. Oh, all the animals were typically all the animals were typically named after characters in their movies. So you had Zorro, um, you had Robin for like Robin Hood. Um, but yeah, she loved her animals, but Zorro was always one of her favorites and, and kind of went everywhere with her. Um, but yeah, I I think the best way to show memorabilia, I don't know if I just start showing things or if people want to see anything particular. Well, let me go, um, let me pick up Facebook yeah, here and see kind of what our um because sometimes questions lead to the memorabilia too. So the show's examples. Yeah, let me let me try to pull up my phone, see if I can get it to work here. And so I think there are lots of posters. Hello, Nick Montag. Thank you for watching. How do you mean a painting now? Let's see. So while you're looking at comments, this is one of my more recent favorite pieces. I mean, I think all collectors have holy grails. Um, probably a lot of holy grails. I don't even know if they exist yet until I come across them, but. <laughs> Um, when Charlotte, her mother, was dying of cancer, I mean, they didn't have the pain medication and the treatment back then as we do now. She took a painting to help ease her comfort. Um, and even Buddy Rogers remembers back when he was filming My Best Girl, um, going and meeting uh, Charlotte for the first time and she was painting, you know, because that's how she had to do it. And so she gave, I'm sure she gave a lot of her, probably her nurses paintings, but she had given Buddy Rogers a painting. So this is actually a painting done by Mary Pickford's mom, Charlotte. And then she also signed Charlotte Pickford down the corner. You know, so it's those things that are just amazing that they still exist, you know, and, and that tells so much of that story. She, uh, Leslie Apple says, I love the photos of Mary with Zorro, the wire fox terrier. Do you know anything about him? So the wire, yeah, and that's always a, a misconception. So you could really tell the difference between Zorro. He had a lot more dark brown on him, and there's not a whole lot of actually photos of her and Zorro. You see, like if you were to Google images, there's Zorro at the typewriter, that's Zorro. Um, but later on, she did have a lot of other terriers. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the one terrier that's most commonly seen in the photos. Um, Sophie, there's a book. No, I don't think you'll be able to find it. Anyways, I'll come to me a little bit. <laughs> but there, um, she did love her wire terriers. Uh, but there, oh, Tony, his name was Tony. 
Um, she had a dog named Tony that was also a terrier that a lot of people think is Zorro. Um, and I could probably pull out one of those photos of her and Zorro. But usually, like, if you see her at a table at Pig Fair and she's got, like, the terrier with her, typically that was Tony. Um, while you're looking, another photo, I, again, I mean, she was the most photographed woman of the 20th centuries. Oh, um, I mean, we have, you know, thousands of <laughs> photos of her. Um, but this is probably one of my favorite ones, um, just because Alfred Cheney Johnson is one of my favorite photographers. And he usually did the Zig Bell girls, um, but he did one photo shoot with Mary Pickford. Uh, so this is actually his personal copy of the photo oh, wow. that Mary Pickford. Um, and again, that, you know, is early 1920s, you know, that really is, like you said, the curls. Um, but the fact that it was here's a Zeke Felder, and if anybody knows the history of her brother, Jack, I mean, he married several <laughs> Zeke Felder, Saul Thomas and Marilyn Miller. Um, and then the fact that he also photographed Mary. So that's probably my favorite. Catherine Bird is saying, show everything, everything <laughs> in all caps. So the demand for Pickford memorabilia shots is- Well, just everybody hold up the oval team when you've had enough. <laughs> yes. Um, this is probably every one question I always get asked if there was ever a fire, what would be one thing I'd grab? <laughs> um, either I would say I would burn with everything or <laughs> I would try to take everything. But this was Mary Pickford's bed doll. So this is the doll she had in bed with her up until she died. Um, so this went up in the 81 auction. Um, it was bought by Debbie Reynolds. And it was one of the last pieces, even after Debbie Reynolds passed away, that she was willing to give up. And she even hand wrote a card with the doll and said, this is Mary Pickford's bed doll up until the day she died. Um, and it, it's even hard to really see it on the, the camera, but it's just long, beautiful. It's just, it's an amazing doll. So um, when that came up for auction, my husband was not like, <laughs> he made sure we were getting that doll. <laughs> Danny Miller says, did they at least preserve any of the insides of Pick Fair, like built-ins, et cetera, and move them out of the house? Half of my house is filled with the remains of West Adams' houses that were torn down. Well, I mean, the furniture, so I don't know if she can, so if you can move the computer a little bit. So I, I mean, I try to have some furniture. So there's this table in the corner. This is a Pick Fair table. You know, the nice thing with Mary Pickford is she saved everything. Um, and when, like it's in 1981, so she died in 1879, her first auction was in 1981, and my husband and I just actually a few weeks ago was able to track down the gentleman who actually put on the 1981 auction, which was, we went, you know, mass, of course, and we sat down with them and just talked to them forever, you know, because he would have been the last person to really go through pick fair and pull everything, and stuff did go to the family, but he was allowed some things via the will and the foundation to keep as well. But the fact that everything did go up for auction meant that so many people were able to hold on to things. And, and some of the biggest bidders, you know, Debbie Reynolds, of course, she was trying to save everything at that time. Same thing with Jane Withers. Um, in fact, this auctioneer had some kind of come between the two of them because they fought so much about who wanted what rather than kind of working together to get some of the stuff. And actually, Yvette Miller was one who bid on some stuff. And I think she got painting a few things. Um, Eve Plum at the time um, wanted to play Mary Pickford, so she got several things which have now been donated to the Mary Pickford Foundation. But as it goes for like actual doorknobs, nothing, I, there's a gentleman who occasionally puts things on eBay, but I haven't seen a provenance to really prove. I, I'm very big. Anybody who's in the collector world knows you kind of have to be a snob and, and really have to provenance so you are broken, you know, you lose our money in, in a heartbeat. I don't call it a snob. I call it discriminating. Okay. <laughs> Good. I like that word better. Yeah, we discriminate. <laughs> um, but then there was another auction. Um, Sophie, can you hand me this little box up on the table? So there was another auction. Julian's had one in 2008, which was at the buddy had passed away. Um, so they had a lot of stuff. But it turned out that Mary's great, so Gwen's daughter, Mary's great niece, actually had an auction in Florida. So like this would have been Lottie Pickford's box. And oh, wow. I mean, I don't know if there's really much of anything Lottie's that exists, but you know, so I, I mean, the stuff comes up now and then we have to really dig and it's a full-time job finding this stuff. But yeah, unfortunately I haven't really found actually things like doorknobs or, you know, stuff you're right should have been saved. There's 
to build our own little mini pig there. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, Mindy Garza is asking about the Peter Pan question. Oh yeah, uh, so I pulled out my image. Um, I can pull out a couple of those. So Peter Pan, so Mary wanted to do a couple movies. Um, when they were gonna do the Peter Pan movie, um, the movie was, oh, here, this is the Peter Pan one. Um, he, the author of Peter Pan, even though it was gonna be a Paramount movie, and at that time, Mary was already with the United Artists, but it was gonna be done by Paramount. And Paramount was okay if they had to bring in an actress that wasn't part of the studios because they really wanted to make the author happy. Um, and it came down to the author having to make the decision yeah, Mary Pickford wanted to be Peter Pan, uh, Gloria Swanson. There's some rumors of Charlie Chaplin wanting it, but I've never been able to, you know, make um, use of that knowledge or not to, to prove it. Um, but then what the, and, and actually the author really had Mary Pickford in the running. That was going to be the person who's going to play Peter Pan. I mean, she really played it in real life. You know, here's again, a 30 year old woman that can play a child role. Uh, but he really wanted somebody who had a, not much of a name yet. He wanted to bring up somebody new, which is why he did Betty Bronson. Um, but that photo that Sophie just hung up was actually Mary on set. Yes, you know, so there was no hard feelings. She came and even visited, you know, Betty on set of uh, Peter Pan to, to greet her and not show any hard feelings. And this photo here um, is Mary with the role of Alice in Wonderland. So that I was, was just asking about that. That was the other role that she wanted to play. So when Walt Disney came to Hollywood, um, you know, she encouraged him to come over to United Artists. And one of the first things she wanted to do with Walt Disney was, I want to be Alice in Wonderland. So they were, you know, she, it is a photo. She did the whole dress shoot, makeup shoot, everything. Uh, but then Paramount beat them to the punch and they did their own Alice in Wonderland as a story of, of why that never happened. But, you know, that's that other type of, Famous child role we think of that Mary really wanted but never happened. Benjamin is asking, do you have autographed photos of Mary? And did she continue to sign later? Yeah, I mean, there's, I know already started, <laughs> she's looking right now at all. Um, I have a lot of signed things in Mary paper. She did sign quite a bit. Um, there wasn't really ever, even up until I would say, you know, until the, the 70s, she, um, yeah, you can just probably start picking things. <laughs> uh, like here's a photo that was signed by both Mary. I have a few. And that was always some hardest things I tried to look for were things that were signed by both Mary and Doug. Uh, so I think I have about four or five different signed images of the two of them together. Uh, I have a few signed with both um, Mary and Buddy. Uh, I think he had me that one on the wall. Um, Sophie's gonna grab this really pretty one that I love. Sometimes you might not sign right on the photo, but, um, and then I have manuscripts that she's written. Um, you can probably take us to the screen. Lots of signed contracts. Um, oh, wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, that was a, a, an amazing one. Um, but going back to the whole idea of Peter Pan is these contracts are kind of fun. What I'll do is have Sophie just, so this one's actually Doug's. When Douglas Fairbanks did The Nut, I don't know if you've ever seen that one, but back then, whenever they wanted to do a book, they had to go to the Library of Congress and they would have to get these all, these cards and these contracts signed for them to even then be able to turn that book into a movie. So we have quite a few of these contracts, either from both Doug and as well as Mary, um, for some of the, the books that they wanted to turn into movies. So we have a lot of contract types of autographs as well um, from them as well um, to go with that. That's really interesting. It's so fascinating to kind of get a look at behind the scenes what they were doing in order to get these. Yeah, and, you know, you, you do become discriminated you know, because there is so much signed by Mary. You, you find the things that are the most unique, whether it was something she signed to a family member um, or like, I mean, it's great to find something she signed uh, Mary Moore. You know, Gladys Mary Moore because she signed to Owen Moore. Need to find something that she signed, you know, Mary Fairbanks, you know, because there's always going to be things that I signed Mary Pickford, but to find things that, again, kind of focus in on her life a little bit. This one, uh, Sophie's brain, this is what Sophie loves because it's got the puppies. <laughs> but um, so that one she signed to her cousin, Isabel Sheridan. So it's Mary with holding the puppies. 
And above it is um, a telegram. And that's what they used to do invites to pick there. So if you had a party, you would send everybody the telegrams before they had the really pretty invites. So, you know, like I said, that's something she signed to a family member. I love the picture for covered in puppies. <laughs> Who doesn't, right? <laughs> I want to be that way all the time. Yeah. Jack Priest is asking us, do you have any handwritten notes from Mary? Would love to see. I, I probably do. I'm trying to think what folder a hand note might have been. Um, let me think about There is, I'm just trying to figure out which way to point. So let me think about that. We'll come back to that one. Okay. Um, sorry, if you hear that noise, <laughs> that's my bird. <laughs> and he has a raven. Um, am I going to choose? I'll show one thing to kind of um, have some fun. So this is Mary Pickford's shoes. To show how tiny this woman is, she's, these shoes are four and a half, whatever a four and a half would have been. Um, these shoes she wore um, when she dug ground at the motion picture home. Uh, so there's quite a few photos. And this is the, these peep toe shoes. It was kind of her favorite shoe come in the 40s. Um, but to give everybody an idea of how tiny Mary Pickford was, you can probably see the label. It says Mary, made specifically for Mary Pickford. Um, she, the person who did the 81 auction had um, so many of her costumes, like Little Lord Fauntleroy. And at the time, he had an eight-year-old daughter. And as we were getting everything ready for auction, he let his daughter play dress up. And here's an eight-year-old that just barely fits into all the costumes. That really gives you an idea of how tiny Mary Pickford was for even to have an eight-year-old just. Danny Miller is saying, and is Angie in LA? Will she be doing any post-pandemic tours of her? <laughs> I am in LA. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, these chairs here, like from Phil Steele, you know, when my husband and I moved here from LA, that was always kind of our thing is we didn't want just Ikea first. We wanted everything to have a story, you know? So our chairs, our tables, you know, we, we try like my vanities from Phil Stiller. Uh, you know, so we just, you know, it's fun talking pieces. And uh, working close with Hollywood Heritage, I do oftentimes take some of our stuff over there. You know, back pre-pandemic when we actually like, had live events, if there was something that I had stuff on, I always, and that, that was always my mission when I started collecting is I didn't want to be one of those collectors that put things away and never share with anybody. Our, our mission was is anything that we got, we wanted to be sure we had, whether it's a researcher, you know, we had, like I said, somebody that's writing a book that'll send scans of photos. We want to make sure that this is accessible to anybody, not just us. Even and I feel so it. fortunate that I've met so many collectors like yourself that are so generous. I mean, that's really how I learned so much about film history, how I found great guests for Hollywood Kitchen. There's just so many collectors that have opened their hearts, their homes, their collections. And I'm, I'm just so grateful for and that. And let's say, you know, we're just stewards. You know, we're, if this is all gonna move on to somebody else down the road too, and that's what preservation is, is, you know, everything we have is in archival books. You know, we, we, we get the stuff, we save it and, and make sure it's gonna be around for, you know, years to come. You know, like I said, Theta Bar is our other collection. And like, as soon as some of our costumes started coming up, the same thing, we're like, we gotta make sure we get it so we can make sure we can preserve it and, and take good care of it. Absolutely. Let's see. Is there a book that says Mary Pickford's family, like um, Jack? Those are some good signs. Um, Ruth is saying, I want to have lunch and a tour at Angie's house. <laughs> <laughs> you might have a lot of people showing up on your lawn at some point. Yeah, in the the little little time. Time. <laughs> so another interesting at Pick Fair. So Pick Fair had an upstairs attic. And the attic was called their Oriental Room or their Asian Room. So a lot of Pick Fair was made up of a lot of French inspiration, a lot of Italian, and a lot of Asian. She, those were the countries she loved to go. So she had a whole floor up in the attic. It was a very small floor, but she had a lot of this Asian stuff. Um, so you can even see at the top corner of the circle stickers oh. that would have been from the 81 auction. So she had a lot of these type of paddles. Um, this is her mahjong. Again, that was a big game of the women back in the 20s. So this was Mary Pickford's mahjong kit. And on the top, it has her. Uh, MPF initial so for Mary Pickford Fairbanks on there as well. Uh, so that kind of gives you the idea too, you know, that Asian inspiration that she had. 
And for and those of you, some of it was fake. <laughs> you know, like she had Rembrandt's um, on the wall that were actually fake. Like I think she, you know, even though she loved the stuff, you know, she she was a money woman. You know, she didn't always buy the, the actual stuff either, which is what I love about her. <laughs> and for those of us who live in LA, you can drive by the United Artists Movie Palace, which is not open right now, but it's part of the Ace Hotel in downtown LA. And that was Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks's idea because they wanted it to look like the cathedrals they've seen in Europe. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's see, some posters. Um, so yeah, I get the My Best Girl free sheet. I got sparrows. Um, so if you want to start bringing those posters over there. Um, so she'll just start bringing over some posters that we have. Jack Priest wants to know, do you have any costumes or pieces of clothing? More, um, no costumes. We have everyday clothing. So like we got shoes, I got some of her coats. Um, you know, so it, it more of her everyday type of wear versus an actual, here's what she wore in a movie. Um, this is um, from Coquette. So a lot of, you know, we see it's the standard posters, but a lot of uh, theaters made their own posters. And I think the, what I like about this one that was made by a theater is because they emphasize this was her first talk film. It's like here, Mary Pickford talk. You know, they really want to emphasize that where the actual studio produced movies uh, posters didn't. Um, as I mentioned, Lottie Pickford, Lottie was Mary's sister, um, and she did some movies. She wasn't obviously the talent of the family, but she probably, um, probably very few movie posters of her exist. Um, this is an original House of Bondage poster with Lottie Pickford on it. That's very um, rare. And then Rosita's coming up next, so this is a half sheet for Rosita, and Rosita um, a lot of her costumes are actually at the Natural History Museum, NHM, uh, which is a glare. So this is a half sheet for Rosita. And her costumes, especially like her gowns, actually have Vaseline glass beads. So in the black light, they just glow. I mean, the costumes from that are unbelievable. And, and sometimes NHM will do like a pick for an event and they would um, go ahead and put the costumes on display. So we're very fortunate that a lot of her costumes are actually in museums because she donated a lot of herself um so while there are some costumes that do pop up now and then option a majority of her personal favorite costumes have already been donated whether it was to uh, nhm or um, library of congress got a lot of films she was very big on donating this is for um little lord fontley roy we still have a frame it, but it's just beautiful of her sitting there um, and she also plays the mother and yeah. the little Lord Fauntleroy in that one. Yeah, she did that twice in two movies where she, again, working with Charles um, Rocher on just having that amazing art of, you know, lighting, being able to be creative with playing two roles. Uh, she really did have that down pat. And then, um, oops. <laughs> Here, you get me that window card too. See, here's the... This is for a little Annie Rooney. Like I said, this is my husband's favorite movie. So here's a window card. And it's just adorable. It just shows her being that boyish girl, being very playful. And in fact, when that movie, you mentioned the United Artists Theater, right down the road from its million dollar theater. And that's where that movie premiered. And everybody who attended got these little bricks. And actually the bricks were made by the LA Brick Company, but on them is engraved little Annie Rooney. So when you attended the premiere, you got those fun little bricks. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> and then up, she's got one more poster. So this is just, um, we have a few of these are just ones I ran around and dug up, but like, and then she did a lot of promotional posters. This really wasn't for any specific movie per se, but it's just, again, a publicity po uh, poster that's just beautiful of her. But um, so what I'm kind of doing too is um, I'm trying to scan so many of our photos, take pictures of a lot of our stuff, and eventually at my website, I would love to have everything online. Again, it, it's to show people what we have so people can enjoy it as well. You know, so that's kind of my goal is eventually get all these photos scanned. Um, you know, photos or a diamond dozen, but this is probably my favorite movie still. And it's actually probably more of a mini lobby card. Again, it's for Phantom and Cricket. Um, not only was the movie lost, 
but there has probably been rarely ever anything, even a photograph come up of Phantom and Cricket. I don't know why. I don't know if a lot of it was destroyed. Um, this one actually came up right over the holidays. Um, those that are collecting right now on eBay, there's this um, Brown Brothers archive. It's probably the last of the largest photo archives that are now going up for auction. Um, and Brown Brothers was sitting on this Phantom and Cricket. So, um, you know, I would love to get more Phantom and Cricket stuff, you know, but I just, you know, I don't know why it doesn't exist, but so as small of a little photograph that is, it's it's most meaningful because it's probably one of the only ones that have ever come up um, for auction. And I, I feel so lucky that there are plenty of films that have survived that are on mm -hmm. DVD. So if people are watching and they, they want yeah, to learn I mean, more about Harry Pickford. Like over here at my table, I mean, all these are all DVDs. So a lot of them have been done, you know, like Kino, some great DVD companies. That them out. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of them go out of publish, you know, out of print, and then, you know, eBay oftentimes we have to get some of them. But yeah, there's a large amount of DVDs, a lot of great books. Um, I always, if somebody wants to read about Mary Pickford, get started, I always say start with her autobiography. Uh, because, I mean, A, it's an autobiography, but I do find a lot of the um, biographies that are out there are based with her autobiography as a core. It's almost like they took her autobiography and just expanded on a little bit more. Um, so I always start with uh, Sunshine and Shadows, which like I said was her autobiography. But yeah, I mean, then there's my other favorites, probably um, um, Christelle Schmidt's uh, Queen of the Movies, because again, it's not as much of her life, but like you said, it highlights all the movies that are still existing. No, that's it, I mean, that's okay. <laughs> Um, hold on one second. I'll show a couple favorite things before we um, wrap up. Um, oh, yes. Any more questions, guys? Please put them in the comments. If uh, we don't get to them live on the show, then Angie would be definitely happy to answer them on Facebook directly for you. Yeah. I have one book edition, but um, so in here, I think. Like here's Jack. So I do have some signed photos of Jack Pickford. Um, I have some signed ones of Lottie, but you can't find that book right now. But Jack was extremely handsome. I mean, he's the other one that got the talents of the family too, I think. <laughs> yeah, I've always heard just negative things about him personally and professionally, but then the first time I ever saw the Goose Woman from 1925, I was blown away. He is fantastic yeah. in that film. And I completely sort of looked at him with a new new perspective after watching that. Yeah. And then, um, you know, just it's Mary, fashion, Mary Pickford fashion, but she got tons of keys for cities. So um, this one is my weapon if ever anybody comes and breaks into my house to steal <laughs> something on Mary's. This thing is so heavy. It was for, um, this one's Salt Lake City. <laughs> I think that one is for like, um, maybe like Portland, Oregon or something. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's fun when these things turn up. Oh yeah, that would be really Hollywood to have a burglar break in and you, you attack them with Mary Pickford's key to the city. That's, that's kind of awesome. <laughs> and this is probably the last photo I'll show. Well, two of them, because this one you like. This is her in a kitchen, of course, Hollywood Kitchen. Oh, cool. And I love it. This one was done by Russell Ball, photographer, and he actually personally signed this one. So I think it was just to her. And it's probably going to be really hard to tell in the camera. Um, but she's wearing a see through negligee. So, I mean, you would probably never see anything of Mary Pickford in the nude, but if you look very closely, <laughs> It's revealing, <laughs> which, you know, like I said, I think that probably was just done for her, um, you know, for her to keep, because it did come from her estate as well. But, um, you know, that's just amazing in itself to, to still have that exist. Would you say that's probably one of the rarest pieces in your collection? Um, that photo, I mean, yes and no, it, it's hard. I, I think I always, every day you could ask me that question, I'd probably tell you something different of, you know, what I, I think is the rarest, but like I think Alfred Cheney Johnston, you know, is probably one of my rarest and hardest to find, but that's up there too, you know, having a photo of that revealing of her. Um, then you get to the more common things that I think probably a lot of people have is, you know, she was the first actress to endorse a product like um, 
like the Pompeian beauty. So she did a lot of these yard long calendars that so many people find at antique stores today. So that's probably the most common artifact that you can collect in Mary Pickford. Which now actresses getting beauty deals with I at home or whatever. I know they all have their perfumes or cosmetic lines, you know, it's that's an everyday thing, but yeah, I mean, like I said, every day you can ask me something different. I'll tell you something's rare, <laughs> you know, depending on how I feel that day. <laughs> and there's a feeling. What What are you seeking that you haven't found yet for your collection? What is something that you're really? Yeah, I would say anything that's um, labeled Gladys Smith, you know, probably her, you know, child theater days would be what I'm I'm after most of that, anything like that came up. And I, I think there's like one pin we know of that I think is at Library of Congress or, or some place where it should be. Um, but I would love to at some point, you know, get something that was probably, you know, Gladys Smith related, or again, getting maybe some more stuff of the siblings, like a Jack's and Lottie's that, you know, we got Lottie's box, you know, that's about it. Um, but like I said, Mary Pickford herself cut so much stuff that, you know, it's, it's an easy, Anybody who like I said, wants to get into collecting, she's a great start because a lot of it turns up now and then. Well, thank you so much, Angie. This has been fascinating. And I, I really can't think of a better way to kick off women's history oh, than I know. Mary Pickford. I know, and then the Academy Awards, hopefully they'll do something with it coming up in the next couple months. And you know, again, you can think of Mary, you know, from that. And yeah, I mean she really is, I think, kind of that mother of Hollywood of the movies. You gotta keep her legacy going. So the new generation of filmmakers and actors and actresses and you know, just anybody has got an interest, you know, keep Mary Pickford's legacy going. That's well, her you, you do an outstanding job of that through your collection, through your work with Hollywood Heritage, and through your blog, Tencel and Stars, which I will post a link to it also on the blog. Okay. Yep. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. This has just been delightful. Thank you so much sure. for sharing. Yeah, thank you for coming. I'll watch your posts, you know, for the next you know few days. So that way, if there's still questions that come up, or if somebody wants a closer photo of something, you know, just holler and I'll, I'll post a photo of it. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again. I can't tell you how interesting this has been, and I've learned a lot. I think a lot of people out there have learned a lot too, and. Uh, are you are you ready for your oval team? Because that was I know I've been kind of sipping on it. It's been beginning, and you got some too, so perfect. <laughs> I, I woke up this morning and realized I'd forgotten to get it, so I made a mad dash to the grocery store to <laughs> I know I feel like it's a Christmas story when they're listening to their oval team radio show. You know? But um, well, to no. Mary. Yep, to, to Mary. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angie. All right, bye. bye.